Hello, welcome to lecture 5 uh, in the series of uh, lectures for risk assessment and uh, life cycle analysis in the, as part of ecology and environment course. Uh, in this lecture, we are looking at a, a case study for remediation. Um, we will try to cover uh, uh, all the aspects that we have uh, discussed in this uh, series of lectures. Uh, this is based on a true case study, however the names have been omitted, uh, names of the corporation, the chemical and the uh, uh, agencies have been omitted, uh, but this is based on true data that is uh, available and the objective here is to illustrate the importance of the entire process that we have discussed so far um, through this very comprehensive example and, uh, and there are a large number of examples of this nature, but this is one example that, that covers the uh, a very uh, wide spectrum of whatever we have discussed in the class and, uh, and uh, it can be quite illustrative. So, uh, it is a story that begins with a field observation and uh, as part of routine monitoring of environmental quality of a river, a fish in this particular river, um, this river is a very well known uh, 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 river uh, and for commercial activity. Uh, the fish were sampled routinely and uh, found that uh, a very uh, high concentration of a known class of organic chemicals was present in the fish. And this uh, high concentration that was present in the fish, uh, uh, this chemical A as part of routine toxicology, it was already known that the chemicals of this class tend to accumulate in the fish and therefore can also accumulate in human beings and causing a range of health effects. So, so uh, chemical A was already known to have uh, as part of uh, the uh, process of toxicology, uh, uh, it was well known, all properties of A were known and, uh, and it was found that this was present in concentrations that were uh, unacceptable uh, for quality. So, as part of a routine activity of monitoring, so this uh, stresses the importance of routine monitoring of natural, uh, uh, in the presence of anthropogenic sources, uh, it is always possible that uh, a particular chemical can enter the environment. So, this is uh, an illustration of why routine monitoring is important, uh, monitoring uh, uh, and sensing of pollutants uh, is important. So, uh, there was a response from a regulatory agency. So, regulatory agencies uh, are, a regulatory agency is like uh, the Central Pollution Control Board in India or uh, any environmental protection agency in any other country. Uh, all countries have one and they are responsible for maintaining uh, uh, environmental quality. Um, and this regulatory agency, let us call it as R, responsible for maintaining environmental compliance, started an investigation using environmental forensic tools. So, uh, environmental forensic tools are things like what we have already discussed in this class. And so, if a chemical is found downstream in a river, the source must be upstream somewhere. And also, you have signatures, you have a particular, in this particular case, the chemical A is what is responsible. and. Uh, it was soon discovered that the specific class of chemicals was only manufactured by one corporation X which had manufacturing plants along the river and nobody else in the region and, uh, and therefore it was very easy and uh, so we go to a little bit of uh, this thing on this chemical A was an invention of corporation X. So, it is not a, there are very cl wide class of chemicals, organic chemicals, so some of them are found in nature and those so manipulated slightly in order to give specific properties for a specific application. Uh, this was the same, but it was an invention based on other known compounds and uh, a very large number of chemicals like this are invented by, uh, by chemists all around the world and properties of these chemicals are measured for various applications and uh, people also measure environmental uh, uh, properties, properties of environmental relevance of fate and transport and toxicology and all that. So, it was a key invention of the products. Uh, this, this chemical uh, A was invented by Corporation X because it served a very specific purpose in one of their products and uh, one of their key products and uh, the idea was it was designed to be non-biodegradable since it would ensure a very long life of their products and uh, it had specific properties, but in the process of doing so it also was very difficult to degrade, biodegrade. When we say non-biodegradable it is not non-biodegradable, it is very small low biodegradability and uh, it would ensure a very long life of the product. So, this is often the case and um, um, this is the case with uh, say something like plastics for example. Plastics are a very good 
they have very good applications in our daily life. But we also know that there is a lot of, lot of plastic which are not biodegradable and it just stays in the environment and there, every day we see some case or the other of uh, uh, an, uh, a problem that, that has arisen because of uh, the plastics and their durability in the uh, environment and they do not they don't go and the volume of plastic itself, the management of that is a sheer big problem. Um, so anyway, coming back to this problem, this product however, no product is, is used indefinitely and we know that from our experience that we have uh, telephones or we have mobile phones or television sets, uh, they have hundreds of components made of different materials and they do not last uh, forever, they have a finite lifetime because something or the other, some other component breaks down and you cannot use it anymore. And so this is the same thing happened and these components were not used forever and then when the products were defunct, products was dismantled and the chemical way was disposed in the river. So this is the, uh, this of course there is no proof that the chemical was disposed in the river but because it was found in the river then the assumption is that it was disposed in the river or it somehow ended up in the river. So um, this is the usual assumption and sometimes it may just be that uh, people just must have thrown the used product into the river and all that. So there, there is a lot of uh, uh, speculation about that but since it happened over a long period of time, there is really no case to that. Uh, so then the agency are commissioned a study to establish the extent of the problem and found out that chemical A contaminated uh, a very large area along the sediment bed in the river. So this extends to a, a long region downstream of the, uh, the factories uh, manufacturing facilities of corporation X along the river and then uh, as we discussed earlier when you have sediment contamination, sediment transport occurs and this can result in the spreading of the uh, contamination from its original location and, uh, and uh, extends the problem. And it was estimated that millions of cubic yards of sediment were contaminated. So, uh, measurement of this extent of contamination itself is a very challenging task and it is not easy, it is expensive. And one has to make uh, use of uh, uh, very smart tools in order to optimize or reduce the cost of doing it. Uh, and, and economics is invariably linked to any of these kind of issues. So you, you see all these at play here in this, it takes a long time to do it. And uh, once they discovered that this was uh, uh, so widespread and they also determined the risk of the chemical A in the water. So so much of chemical in the water, uh, millions of cubic yards of sediment and then uh, they estimated the amount of material that is present and given that they estimate that the risk is, is quite significant um, and therefore recommended to the government that the chemical A be banned. So which means that in the hope that uh, banning this chemical would uh, then uh, f further, uh, you know, would, would prevent the aggravation of the problem any further and taking the uh, advice of the regulatory agency, the government banned this chemical. and. Uh, so this chemical anyway was the, was made by only one company. So at band and then uh, they found other alternatives as is the case usually. So the, uh, the other point that uh, that is being made here is that there are alternatives as was the case with CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons, uh, which might not be as convenient uh, as this one, but there are alternatives. And this is the, this is always the challenge and the opportunity that is presented to scientists and engineers to do the other alternative which can lead to a lesser risk. Uh, so continuing on this, the agency are filed a liability case against the corporation X. So it is a case of remediation of the contaminated sediment and therefore um, as, we, as we talked, we know who is most likely the polluter, the arguments can be made against it but uh, it was very clear in this case since uh, A was produced only by X, no other uh, corporation had the, uh, uh, the rights to it. So it was very clear case. Sometimes in some cases it is not so, so clear and so one has to really uh, uh, use uh, the environmental forensic tools very smartly in order to arrive at a very uh, uh, unequivocal uh, decision whether the particular chemical is coming from a particular source or not. So otherwise it can always be argued that somebody else is doing the pollution. So this is often the case when uh, you have air pollution where you clearly do not have a very specific uh, direction to wind, sometimes it changes and therefore uh, it is very difficult but it is not impossible and people have found tools, mathematical, statistical tools and even physical tools in order to and chemical tools by which you can pinpoint uh, a signature of a pollutant coming from a particular source uh, and this is done uh, routinely. 
So given the enormous scale of the cleanup, Corporation X also appealed and sought uh, cheaper alternatives and this is uh, natural and this again uh, uh, is in line with the uh, sustainability issue that uh, uh, such a large task of cleanup uh, should not break the company. So, the company sought to find out other alternatives for, for various reasons, but it is a very large, it was a very prestigious company and it had its own group of scientists who were very capable of finding alternatives uh, as they had uh, demonstrated uh, <coughs> in previous cases of uh, research in their corporation. <coughs> and one of the alternatives was to assess risk more rigorously, to evaluate if monitored natural recovery would work, which is the cheapest option as we saw in our previous lecture, uh, was viable from a health risk perspective and uh, uh, they found some evidence that it could be, but then again as, uh, as the case would be. A lot of scientific studies were conducted by both the agency and the corporation to evaluate options and they were done in good spirit, uh, I think they were, they were done in, uh, in with the goal of solving a community problem. In the meantime, the case became very prominent through media and the local community was also involved and, and uh, public meetings were held in order to decide um, to provide the options by from both sides, from, from the regulatory agency as well as the corporation. And after uh, more extensive monitoring and research scientific programs, it was determined that the fist in the long term uh, viability of safety, uh, the safest option uh, was uh, decided determined to be dredging. And uh, we saw that dredging is not clear from uh, any effects, uh, therefore there was some concern about it. And therefore, uh, but so the agency ordered dredging of uh, some very highly concentrated regions called as hotspots and, uh, and the process was estimated to take several years just to do this hotspots. It, it was a fraction of the entire uh, contaminated region, but it was still uh, assumed that this, uh, uh, these uh, hotspots would reduce the problem largely. So, as a first step they, they had mapped the entire region and they said they had identified certain spaces, places where they would remove it and therefore hope that uh, it would reduce the problem a little bit and therefore uh, you know not do it uh, you know with a brute force method of then trying to dredge the entire thing and then uh, um, it may not be economically viable. So, this was uh, one of the decisions that was made by a mutual agreement. So, the next stage was to determine the method to conduct the dredging and the disposal of the dredging method. So, as we saw in our previous case, there was you know one just by saying dredging it is not enough and one has to figure out that the dredging process and the disposal itself can release uh, the chemical into the air and so on. And so, people were worried about that. So, along with it there is also this thing that there, are, there may be other chemicals along with it. This is one of the uh, complex uh, complexities of this, this issue of liability because when you are focusing on one particular chemical, there could also be other chemicals while you are doing the uh, dredging which may cause more problems uh, secondary of a secondary nature than uh, the chemical A that you are initially worried about. So, concerns during remediation since it was a river, dredging was expected to cause uh, resuspension and uh, resuspension would result in increased pollution of the water and the increased pollution of water can lead to potential air pollution and so on. So, this was addressed by providing silt curtains. So, what they would do is, uh, let me just illustrate it here by drawing on the side of the, uh, this thing here, that uh, there is a river and the river is flowing here, this is the su surface of the river and uh, if, if dredging is uh, done in this portion and uh, river is flowing in this direction. So, in order to prevent the, this mass to move here, they would put barriers uh, both in this side and this side, this were barriers as we would call as silt curtains, they are, they are called silt curtains, they are, they are curtains literally with very small openings, very small openings allow the water to flow through. So, essentially this entire region would become very highly uh, contaminated, but the rest of the region this will be relatively clean. So, this region here downstream will be relatively clean and only this region will be uh, contaminated. So, what it uh, ends up doing is confine, uh, this, this will confine the uh, contamination to a relatively small region during this. So, they will dredge this one area then they will move to the next area and so on. The problem however, is that the concentration of chemical becomes so high here that it can result in uh, a very high uh, evaporation. Uh, it can result in very high evaporation from this particular site. So, therefore, this, this causes uh, uh, some amount of air pollution risk, but it is better than 
uh, providing uh, this thing. So the other you have to look for other methods in which maybe you can put a barrier here and all that. So but it is inevitable. So this kind of problems do occur and that uh, and that was that was something that one could not uh, uh, work at. So dredging was also expected to cause some disturbance to the ecology of the system and uh, what we mean by that is uh, there is obviously in the marine environment sediment there are other plants and animals that live and this, this is an enormous disturbance. So uh, bringing a large mechanical excavator which is inside a river which means that you have to get into the river and I, I encourage you to go and look at images of uh, dredging equipment, they are, they are very large, they are big, uh, you, you could see it in many places where people do land reclamation, they go in and dredge the uh, bottom and they put it somewhere else. So it is a very heavy duty operation, it is not a simple uh, thing, it, it causes enormous disturbance to the entire region and uh, that is one and second it is also there is quite a bit of noise from the mechanical this thing. So people where care was taken to keep noise below acceptable uh, uh, levels and uh, there was a decibel range in which they had to do all this. So, so you can see that this is a linkage of several other chain uh, of events that needs to happen. So there must be equipment that will reduce the amount of resuspension that will uh, occur. So mechanical dredging uh, devices that were uh, used were such that it would minimize the amount of resuspension and resuspension was further minimized by silt curtains and so on. So there is a there is a long chain of other technological uh, improvements that need to be done in order to do this. So with the dredge material as we had discussed earlier air pollution risk from the barges and transport vehicles uh, carrying the dredge material as material has to be transported somewhere else. So uh, and it has to be disposed and as we discussed earlier not in my backyard principle applies here. So since this was an active river which means that there is a lot of activity going on along the river, there is a lot of residential areas, uh, towns and cities that were along this river, it was very difficult to establish a disposal site and so what they eventually did is found a site where open disposal was not possible but they it was determined that the sediment would be cleaned and the clean material would be used as a commercial filler for parking lots or other, other uses and uh, the, uh, the uh, solvent, the waste material that is extracted would be disposed of in the, in the ways that we had discussed earlier with any other like a waste water or a waste solvent uh, treatment either by incineration or some other method. Uh, so this case study uh, illustrates several key aspects that have been highlighted throughout this module. One of the first main things is the design of a product without designing the effect on the environment when it goes out of use. This is what is called an end of life. Um, well, end of life is a term that is used in product management where uh, we, have, we see several examples of that we have end of life of mobile phones, we do not know where it goes, we say we recycle it but we do not know exactly where it goes. So <coughs> its effect on the environment whether it is incinerated or whether it is uh, dumped in a landfill or is something that needs to be taken care of because so in certain countries where uh, land is available you know very large amount of land is available you can dispose it somewhere and it may not affect you much um, but in countries where population density is very high such as in India or in countries like Japan where uh, it, you cannot find land, land is very high premium, it is imperative that uh, we find other options and one of the biggest option is to design it at the, at the source that if you anticipate that a product is going to be of a certain, uh, certain problem you do not know, you do not have a road map of how you are going to deal with it at the end of its life then uh, I think it is, uh, you, you will run into problems as in this case uh, because the focus was more on one particular aspect of the product, uh, the commercial and the utilitarian aspect of it. But uh, So as with this, the, the philosophy of this course is to sensitize engineers in order to think about uh, at the end of life uh, aspects of any process or product. Um, and we see lots of cases as you can look around and I encourage you to go and uh, look at uh, the aspect of any product that you use and see what happens to it when you, when you do not use it, when you throw it away, where does it go and so you can try to trace its uh, life cycle. And the design of a viable option, disposal, disposal option must be presented when it is uh, formed. So it is the responsibility of whoever is doing the process in order to do this and design of remediation options that are environmentally sustainable. So is there a systematic method for doing all of this and uh, this is the method called life cycle analysis or LCA which is the organized method for doing this and uh, 
in the next lecture we will discuss uh, some of the formal aspects of uh, and some examples of what life cycle analysis means. Thank you.